The Bay Area is a magnet for transplants. I, for example, found my way here from Iowa. But when it comes to the Bay itself, some newcomers can be a big problem. One cloudy spring morning near Fruitvale Bridge in Alameda, I set out with marine biologist Andy Cohen to hunt for invaders hiding in the marshes and intertidal zones of the Oakland estuary. Let's, um, there's actually something here I wanted to show you. I noticed this before. Oh, right here. There's uh, this little box here. Yes. You can find these things around the bay, virtually every, every place where anyone goes fishing. This is a, a bait box. Oh. Um, there's some dead pile worms. Wow. Um, and, and they're packed in this seaweed. And so these pile worms are, are worms um, from the coast of Maine. Actually, these are these little exotic species starter kits placed out in all around the bay. Something like nine tons of the seaweed a year ends up in the bay with the encumbering organisms from, from the coast of Maine. And we know of several species that have become established here. This discovery would set the tone for the day. Something as innocuous as a fisherman's discarded box of bait worms is actually contributing to the rapid transformation of San Francisco Bay. So um, we see it, we, before we even got started coming down, we saw two exotic organisms. That was the worm and the seaweed. And here's your third one here. Oh. This is uh, an exotic cord grass or a hybrid with an exotic cord grass from the East Coast. Why is the Atlantic cord grass such a problem? Well. Um, there are a series of issues, and, and uh, the one which I think is of greatest concern is that it takes over and totally transforms native marshes. Um, there are impacts in the mudflats where it, where it uh, goes, but the, the resident marsh animals, several of whom are very rare or endangered, um, really have no other place to go if the native marsh disappears or doesn't work for them. What is an invasive species? The term I generally use is exotic species, and I mean it's something which is not native here, wouldn't have found it here 200 years ago. And it's, and it's now here because of human activities. Probing out here. Yep. Just keep digging. Let's we'll see okay. what we find here. Cohen estimates that there are more than 250 non-native organisms that have become quite cozy in the bay. In many of the habitats in the Bay Delta system, up to 90% of the species are exotic, which means most of the native species have already been displaced. This gives our bay the dubious distinction of being the most invaded aquatic ecosystem in the world. What do you say to people who, who say, well, what's the big deal? Things change, ecosystems evolve. What's the problem? One is that uh, some of these things cause specific problems. They, they'll eat, eat things that we want to eat, or they clog our water systems, or they, in some cases there are human health impacts from organisms that show up in the bay. And some of them have relatively little effect. Some, some don't become that, that common. Others just have enormous impact on the bay. A single species, in some cases, has, has altered the way the ecosystem functions. One especially dramatic example of that is the overbite clam. In 1986, a biology class discovered three of them in Sassoon Bay. By 1987, it was the most abundant clam in the North Bay. It's a voracious filter feeder that devours the phytoplankton that native fish and other species eat. Some scientists contend that this fingernail-sized clam has contributed to the collapse of entire populations of fish, such as the Delta smelt. Yes, what's next in our urban biology lesson here? Our tour will be, um... We're out here at uh, Crown Beach in Alameda. Um, this, uh, these rocks here actually cover over the line of the intake pipe for the Alameda Lagoon. There's oh. an inlet here and another one in there. And we're gonna turn over some of these rocks and see what, see what we've got living under them. So what we've got living on this rock is a, a uh, Mediterranean mussel. This is a native chitin. Uh, an amphipod from the Atlantic. Guys scurrying around. Here, these slow moving legs are a native sea spider. Very cool little guy. We have uh, an Atlantic sponge, oh, an Atlantic sea squirt down here, a European bryozoan. It's a native flatworm. Wow. Very cool thing. Oh, yeah. um, over here As I played a, with my local flatworm friend, I asked Andy how these other critters managed to travel to our bay from the other side of the planet. Ballast water is currently the largest mechanism bringing organisms in. From our studies, somewhere between about half and perhaps as much as 90% of the organisms now arriving in San Francisco Bay seem to be arriving in ballast water. 
Okay, so what is ballast water? Ocean-going ships have a bunch of huge water tanks in their hulls that they use to stabilize their loads and adjust their depths. Without ballast, they'd keel over or break in half. Ships suck up water in one place and dump it out in another, millions of gallons of it. In that water are hosts of tiny hitchhikers, clams, worms, crabs, the things Andy'd been showing me. And when these stowaways get here, they make themselves right at home. How do non-native species uh, impact biodiversity in the bay? Before these arrived, the fauna and the flora of the bay were different from what we would find in bays in other parts of the world. Increasingly now, as we go from one environment to the other, we see the same organisms in one place after another. And so what we have is this homogenization of the, of the world's flora and fauna, kind of the McDonaldization of the world. And everywhere you go, you see the same organisms from one place to another. And, and the sense that you're in a new place with something new to, to show you as, as, as you move from one part to another world is something that we're losing. More than 3,000 ships from every corner of the globe pass through the Golden Gate each year. That's a lot of ships and a lot of ballast water to keep in check. Past efforts to regulate ballast discharge have been ineffective. In 2006, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed into law a bill by State Senator Joe Simidian of Palo Alto that gives California the toughest ballast water rules in the nation. The bill is pretty simple and straightforward. It says by 2020, we're going to be down to zero detectable discharges. In the meantime, we're going to make steady progress over a period of years. We're going to increase the fines so that people who are violating the law are punished and have some real incentive to stick with the rules. Starting in 2009, ships would be required to phase in the systems that would remove or kill organisms that live in their ballast water, and no discharge of organisms larger than 50 microns, about the size of a grain of sand, will be allowed. By 2020, the final standard goes into effect, which allows no detectable discharge of living organisms. Currently, no technology exists to meet any standards. Uh, there will be a review of the, of the technologies out there and the implementation schedule, and if it's determined that ships should be able to meet it with existing technology, we will move forward and we will be in compliance. Look, there are lots of different ways to solve the problem. It can be ultraviolet, it can be heat, it can be chemicals, it can be taking the stuff off the boats, putting it on shore and processing it there. How people get there, that's up to them. But the standards are now there for them to meet, they know what the expectations are, and we think the technology will be driven by those standards. So this is the U.S. Coast Guard base on, on Coast Guard Island in the Oakland Estuary. It's, a, it's usually been a very good place to find things on the docks. Maybe one reason why people are only just now starting to recognize that untreated ballast water is actually pollution is that exotic species just don't seem the same as toxic waste. The, uh, an orange sponge from the Atlantic, a yellow sponge from the Atlantic. When you poke around at the water's edge, most of these critters seem more fascinating than threatening. A, a, a sea squirt from the Atlantic and it's living on a sea squirt from Japan. The establishment of ballast water standards is a big step towards controlling bay invaders. But scientists like Cohen are quick to point out that enforcing the law may prove to be much more difficult than passing it. This is one of the biggest environmental issues facing us. There are things that can be done to, to substantially improve the situation. We've made huge progress with chemical pollution over the last years. We're just at the beginning of this, and there's enormous things we can do to make huge improvements, and yet it isn't going to happen unless that, that voice is there advocating for what needs to be done. 